For the next two days, we're exploring Morgantown, West Virginia. The beautiful Monongahela River and its tributary Decker's Creek create the backdrop for our adventure. It's a pretty impressive trail system that provides us almost 50 miles of connected trail. Following abandoned railroad corridors, we'll tour the historic town of Arthurdale, follow Decker's Creek through Greer Limestone, and enjoy the downhill coast into Morgantown, where we'll spend some time at the History Museum and Morgantown Brewing Company. Then we'll chat with our overnight host at the Modern Homestead Guest House in Reedsville. The next day, we'll explore three connected trails which follow the Monongahela, the Mon River North, Caperton, and Mon River South trails. We'll grab some lunch at the Black Bear Burrito and explore Hildebrand Lock and Dam and end up at Prickett's Fort. This episode sponsored in part by our friends at Modern Homestead Guest House and Coffee Shop. Just outside Reedsville and less than a mile from the Duckers Creek Trail is Arthurdale Heritage. I want to show you why we found it was so interesting to come out here. And so I'm talking with Nora Sutton, who's out here. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and then we'll get into the history of this place. Great, well, I am actually an Appalachian Forest Heritage Area AmeriCorps member serving mm -hmm. with Arthurdale Heritage. Um, it's kind of a mouthful, but it's a great position. I get to help people like yourself and your viewers experience Arthurdale every single day. Yeah, good. So tell us, what is Arthurdale? To explain the history for us. So Arthurdale is actually the first New Deal community in the country, and we pride ourselves on being the first. Um, we were a community created um, under the New Deal, President Roosevelt's New Deal program, but we were built really by the first homesteaders who came here. Mm -hmm. And the homesteaders were impoverished um, and unemployed coal miners and people from other industries. So they came from Mon County, where Morgantown is, and Preston County to build new homes for themselves and for their families in the future. What types of buildings will we see here? Well, you can start at our historic center hall, which was the first building assembled on site. Um, it really was then and is now the heart of the Arthurdale community. Um, so you'll start here, you can see our craft shop, you can stop by in the office and say hi to us and community <laughs> members. Uh -huh. um, and then you'll move into our museum building, which is from local, locally quarried stone. You'll see a bunch of old pictures, artifacts, um, family mementos from that from Arthurdale families that really tell the Arthurdale story. Oh, wonderful. You'll see our original blacksmith forge. Um, you can see our original SO station. And yeah. then you get to go down to an original homestead house that's been preserved as it was built in 1936. How many buildings were here? So originally there were 165 homes built for 165 lucky families, plus the community buildings up here and three school buildings down Route 92. If we wanted to ride our bikes around and see all of those, we could. I yeah. Mean, that's, those are here. Absolutely. And we have a great driving tour brochure with a map um, and a little bit about each building. It actually also points out um, original Arthurdale homes that are now private residences. So it's really neat to see how people have modified and changed, changed their homes over time. Yeah. So Arthur Heritage, truly a unique piece of American history right here near Reedsville. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Nora. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. From here at Reidsville, the Deckers Creek Trail is about 19 miles down to Morgantown. We're going to lose about a thousand feet in elevation and it's supposed to be really pretty. So I can't wait to see it. I think it's going to rain on us, but we're going to ride it anyway. Let's go. Woo! <laughs> a little rain just adds to the adventure of the trail. As you enjoy the scenery, I'll tell you a little about Reedsville. Population 700, it's got a Dairy Queen and a Dollar General, and every town has a trailblazer. Reedsville's is Beth Bonner. She became the first winner of the women's division of the New York City Marathon when it first opened its race to women in 1971. She was 19. 
She's also credited as the first woman to ever run a marathon in less than three hours. No doubt running these mountains every day will give you some strong legs. We did ride through a few rain showers, but we also came across a couple nice shelters along the way too. Decker's Creek Trail uses the old Morgantown and Kingwood Railroad bed. With a total distance of 48 miles, the M and K carried coal, stone, sand, and lumber. By 1906, the line provided twice daily passenger service. More than 10 million ton of limestone is mined out of West Virginia every year. Most of it comes from this quarry. This is Greer Limestone, the largest producer of limestone in West Virginia. Limestone is used in many ways, construction, agriculture, chemistry, and we encounter this giant quarry right along Decker's Creek Trail. We're a little more than halfway to Morgantown. It never bores me to see the cuts they carved in the hillsides to make way for the train tracks. Can you imagine being an engineer and driving a train through this beautiful scenery for work every day? Decker's Creek Trail was built in 1999. Here's just one of many snack shacks along the trail, sure to be busy on a sunny summer weekend. That man in yellow is my friend Adam Wilson. A little camera shy, he was a huge help filming this show. By now you know I'm a huge fan of mountain streams. All this beautiful water we're following is destined for the Ohio River. It's all flowing north, working its way to Pittsburgh. There, it'll start its southward journey around Ohio to the Mississippi River. It's kind of cool to think all this ice-cold, crystal-clear mountain water is going to be part of the warm Gulf of Mexico in the not-too-distant future. Decker's Creek wasn't always so crystal clear. Industrial growth in the first half of the 20th century, with chemical and raw sewage pollution, destroyed the creek. Much credit is due to Friends of Decker's Creek, a nonprofit organization that has worked to clean the creek since 1995. Through volunteer efforts, business partnerships, and lobbying for federal dollars, this stream has gone from discolored and stinky to clear and enjoyable. Friends of Decker's Creek offers youth projects, education, public beautification, and recreational opportunities, all related to the Decker's Creek watershed cleanup and recreational rebirth. Here we're riding into the outskirts of Morgantown, where a manufacturing area has been transformed by big box stores and franchise restaurants. Morgantown is built on the side of a mountain. So, consider that everywhere we visit in the city is uphill from the bike trail. We're going to walk our bikes up to the History Museum. And later, when we go to the Morgantown Brewing Company, there's a staircase that leads from the trail up to their back patio. Oh, and we've reached the end of our ride today. Morgantown has a rich history, and the best way to learn all about it is to come here to the Morgantown History Museum. We're just a little more than a block away from the trail. Pamela Ball here is going to tell us all about it. Pam, thanks so much for having us. You're welcome. We're glad to have you. Um, Morgantown has a very interesting history. We were founded in 1785 uh, by um, Zach Will Morgan. He's the one that laid the town out and that they named the town after. Um, one of the most important things from that colonial period was the fact that uh, Michael Kearns built a flatboat business in Morgantown and people came from all over the eastern part of the country to get a flatboat built and then go on um, to Ohio and then down either to New Orleans or out further west. Um, so lots of people here even in the colonial times. Um, we have uh, very interesting things here that show our industrial history, which was quite important. We had uh, 30 some glass factories in Morgantown in the early part of the 1900s, and only one remains at this point in time. Mm. But we have a large uh, industrial uh, exhibits, we have uh, glass and all the coal and 
the other things that were important here. But uh, one of the things that people like the most when they come here is the Don Knotts display. Uh, the Don Knotts display started back when we started up actually, a family in uh, Pasadena, California, the Bennett family gave us 125 items that their son who had just passed had collected and uh, we got those about six months after we'd started up and that really was the basis of allowing me to write grants and get money and to really have a start. But people come from all over to see anything about Don Knotts because they still really loved. Yeah. I noticed you have a very impressive display of printing presses. Yes, we do. Uh, one of our best and uh, most uh, uh, valued volunteers here is Swifty Schaefer and he and his father had a printing business for many years here in Morgantown and when he found out there was a fledgling Morgantown History Museum as he said, and I saw him, he was breathless, he said, I ran all the way here <laughs> to see. And, and then he got involved with us, and then he ended up, when we got this space down here, setting up a full printing operation, as it would be in a printing shop. Uh, he conducts uh, workshops, and sometimes we'll have, have workshops for kids. But we also had donated a printing press that's kind of unusual from a gentleman down in the very southern part of the state in Greenbrier mm -hmm. County. So that's been a, an important part of the operation. People are fascinated by oh, that. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's an amazing <laughs> display. Mm -hmm. Pamela, thank you so much for sharing your museum with us. Thank you for coming. We appreciate that. Oh, this is a real treat. A real treat right here along the trail. So if you're riding the Mon River Trail System from any direction and you end up in Morgantown, West Virginia, we heard from all over the region that one place we really needed to come to was the Morgantown Brewing Company. And so I'm lucky enough to have snagged Chris here, who's one of the new owners, and we're gonna talk about this place. Chris, tell me, since you're new here, tell me how you got started and tell me a little bit about the history here. Sure, so um, my business partner and I, uh, we were both students at the university here at West Virginia University um, at the engineering college. I was in computer science and he was in chemi, so chemical engineering. Oh. Um, and we wrote a business plan for uh, a brewery. Uh, we had an idea for a gypsy brewery. Um, so we would go to different breweries throughout the state um, and brew our beer on their equipment and distribute it out. Um, and so we won that competition and we got some prize money for it. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and so then uh, we kind of bootstrapped that um, for three years of uh, suffering <laughs> and uh -huh. hard work. Um, and we ended up acquiring the Morgantown Brewing Company. Oh my gosh. Yeah, which is the oldest operating brewery in the state since 1992. Oh, no um, kidding. It's been running, so it's. it's uh, quite a legacy to inherit, yeah. Well, we've heard so many wonderful things yeah. about it. Tell me then, what can someone expect when they walk in the door here? Um, so, I mean, great trail access, as you guys oh, obviously know. Oh yeah, we know. found that out, yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, right on the water, um, and you can expect uh, a really unique tap list uh, with options for everyone's palate. Um, same with our food menu, um, just, uh, a hearty menu with you know lots of different uh, different options for everyone. Yeah, and a great atmosphere and here. A great atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Your beer list seems very um, like it, it goes across a lot of different types. So tell me yeah. a little bit about the craft beers. Yeah. Um, so we have we we kind of specialize in um, in IPAs um, and uh, people who love craft beer will be excited to hear that because that's. 40% of the craft beer market share is okay. IPAs. Um, and then we do lots of specialty beers. Um, we do dessert beers. Uh, we had an award-winning Mexican hot chocolate stout. Um, that was like a spicy chocolate stout, um, high ABV, uh, 
really rich and, mm -hmm. and delicious. But then we also have um, lighter, easy drinking beers. We have Session IPAs. Uh, we have a, uh, our Alpha Blonde, Blonde Ale. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's one of our flagships um, that's been around for a while, and that's one of the more popular options that we have. But there's, there's something kind of for everybody, and there's lots of unique stuff that you yeah. won't be able to find elsewhere, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I noticed your menu is, it's pretty amazing. It sounds wonderful, I can't wait to eat something. Yeah. Um, but the menu, just reading it, is um, pretty inviting. Yeah, um, well, I eat something from this menu yeah. every day. So. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is really good. Yeah. And you were brewing today. Yeah, all day. <laughs> yeah. Chris, tell me what makes a good craft beer. Uh, so, a good craft beer, I would say, is one that um, is unique, um, something that brings people together and, you know, like, a lot of my friends are here <laughs> now, yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, so that, that, that's kind of, that, that's kind of the cool thing about craft beer is, you know, it's, it, it's craft, so it, it's, it's something that we work really hard on and it's, it's not made in some big anonymous warehouse somewhere yeah. and, you know, we spend a lot of time on it, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Chris, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Sure. Can't wait to eat the food here. And uh, again, if you're in Morgantown, I urge you to stop in at the Brewing Company, Morgantown Brewing Company. Thomas is one of the owners of the Modern Homestead here in Reedsville, West Virginia, where we're staying. And Charles, tell us about the rooms that you have to stay because they're beautiful. Thank you. Um, we have two guest houses, so we have five suites that we rent out on a nightly or weekly basis. They are all furnished comfortably and have, have all the amenities that you need for an overnight stay or an extended stay. And for bikers, you also offer some storage for bikes. Yeah, we have a uh, lock garage that we can uh, store your bike for you while you're out doing other day trips. And you have quite a complex here. We're standing in the middle of this beautiful little gift shop. Yes, uh, Modern Homestead is a family-owned business. It started about 30 years ago as Tatham's Garden Center. And since moving to Reedsville, we added the guest houses. We have a little coffee shop in the gift shop that we're standing in. And those pastries in the coffee shop, tell me. Oh, well, we make them um, every day uh, from scratch. Uh, mm. Lots of local ingredients as, we, you know, as they're available throughout the season. And you're very close to the trail. Yes, we're about a quarter of a mile from the um, rail trail, and uh, we're also centrally located uh, for other activities around West Virginia, whether it's Cooper's Rock or Cathedral State Park, Black Waterfalls, Canaan Valley. So we're a convenient jumping off point for whatever type of adventure you'd like. Yeah, what a nice, friendly place to stay. Thank you so much, Trellis. Thank you. To continue our exploration of the Mon River Trail System, we came here to the Van Voorhees Road Trailhead. It's just a couple miles outside of Star City. Now this Mon River Trail North is six miles long and it starts about four miles behind me at the Pennsylvania State Line. There is no trailhead there, so we're starting here. And we have several miles to get in today. riding upstream today, otherwise known as uphill, but it's not much of a grade change, so we won't notice it very much. On a hill overlooking the river, Star City has a history of glass making. I found out that river communities are perfect for glass production with their access to water and sand, and the river provides a shipping route. Here are trail changes names to the Caperton Trail. This striking memorial to John F. Kennedy features John Jr. saluting his father. The Edith Barrel Riverfront Park offers parking, restrooms, and a place to watch the boats go by. We're entering the region of West Virginia University, a school of 30,000 students, known for their athletic teams and the Outdoor Recreation Center, which takes advantage of the natural wilderness so close to campus in its offerings to students. Core Arboretum is 91 acres of natural habitats where you'll see native West Virginia trees, shrubs, and plants. Some of these trees are more than 200 years old. Owned by West Virginia University and managed by the school's biology department, it is open to the public without charge. Three and a half miles of walking trails wind you through an old growth forest and riverside woods. 
That rail line you see above and to my left is the West Virginia University Rapid Transit System. It carries students to each of three campuses in downtown Morgantown. It only operates when school is in session. Caperton Trail offers six miles of paved surface, perfect for rollerblading. Located within the Star City and Morgantown City limits, this trail provides easy access to the riverfront parks, neighboring restaurants, and shopping areas. Well worth the uphill walk into downtown Morgantown is Black Bear Burrito. It seems like the quintessential college town eatery. Good food in a trendy atmosphere. Just perusing the menu as an adventure. Gouda riddens, feta fetish, bear trap, Sergeant Peppers hot or not. They've got a garden chili and pesto quesadilla. It all sounds so good. So, whether you're a meat lover or a vegetarian, I think you can find something here to satisfy your appetite. With a full belly, it's time to get back on the trail. We've a long way to go to Prickett's Fort. Here's an example of the fine use of a steep bank along the river, an amphitheater. I can just imagine what fun events happen here all summer long. Here's where the Deckers Creek and Caperton Trails meet. This bridge takes us over Deckers Creek. That's Morgantown Lock and Dam, completed in 1950 for navigational water flow, but not for flood control. Riding south out of town, we pass behind a lot of retail businesses, but you don't really know they're there. Here we have the Greer Limestone Company again. Leaving the paved trail, we've reached the Mon River South Trail, which is 18 miles of crushed stone. In winter, it makes for great cross-country skiing. We don't expect to see very many people here during the week, but there are frequent weekend events for runners and cyclists, so keep that in mind. We like West Virginia for the wilderness, so expect stunning views of the river, waterfalls, and wildflowers. Don't expect any facilities or snack shops between Morgantown and Prickett's Fort. The Mon River, for as wide as it is, is very windy. You can't tell it while you're riding, but right here we start into a series of oxbows. An oxbow is a U-shaped bend in the river. Hildebrand Lock and Dam, right here, is one of nine structures which provide for year-round use of the Monongahela River between Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Fairmont, West Virginia. That's roughly 130 miles in distance. These dams and locks keep the Monongahela at a depth of at least nine feet for the cargo ships going through. We're riding along the old B&O Railroad line, which played a huge role in our country's history. But it's the future of this trail that's so exciting. This trail is part of the proposed Parkersburg to Pittsburgh Mega Rail Trail. 80% of the 238 mile length is completed. Hoping to be finished by 2028, the P2P Trail would open the region to potentially millions of dollars in tourism revenue and open a whole region of destination possibilities for long distance cycling tourists. When complete, the P2P will connect West Virginia to the Great Allegheny Passage Trail at Connellsville, Pennsylvania. From there, you could ride to Washington, D.C. The Mon River has a rich history associated with the westward expansion of the nation in colonial times. At the end of our ride, we'll get to learn a little what it was like to live in this wilderness in the middle 18th century. Right along the trail is Prickett's Fort. I'm with Greg here who's going to tell us the fascinating things we'll see here. Well, my name's Greg Bray and I'm the executive director here at Prickett's Fort. And what you see here is a uh, replica of a fort that was here in 1774. It was built on the land of Jacob Prickett. Uh, this, built, this fort was built in uh, 1976 for the bicentennial. Uh, it, we have regular employees here, uh, spinner weavers. Uh, we have a hearth cook. We have a blacksmith. Uh, any given day, you could see one of those people. So. 
Explain to us the history of the actual fort, what it was used for back then. The, the, the fort was built in 1774, like I said, and it was a uh, it was precursor to the Revolutionary War. Uh, it was built during Dunmore's War uh, to protect the settlers from uh, Native American attack. Yeah. Uh, so the settlers would... Well, they, they didn't all live there full time. No, they came here from their local, uh, their houses and different places in the community up to 17 miles away early on. Uh, they came here uh, up to 250 people. There was 80 families. Uh, so we can, we can figure out how many uh, actual people were here at any given time. Oh, I see. Uh, so about 250 people at, uh, at most times. Uh, and they would stay here for how long? They would stay, stay here anywhere from a day to six weeks. Like until uh, the uh, danger went subsided? Until the danger subsided, yes. I see. Tell me what else you have to offer here at the park. Uh, here, you know, we, we, it's not just the historic part of the park, but uh, there's a couple things we haven't talked about. The Joe Prickett House, uh, which is a 19th century house. He was, uh, Joe Prickett was the great-great-grandson of uh, Jacob Prickett, whose land this fort was built on. Uh, we interpret that three times a day. Uh, we also have a museum uh, it talks about the whole community. Uh, we have a uh, full gift shop, uh, those type of things. We also have an amphitheater, outdoor amphitheater, uh, which we do local plays. We do four or five concerts a year, free concerts. Uh, we allow the public to come in. Uh, and that's part of my job to uh, recruit talent for the, the uh, amphitheater. Um, we have picnicking, biking, uh, kayaking, uh, so we've got a little bit of everything here at the park. Uh, we get a lot of picnickers here, uh, but uh, in a year's time we get about 110,000 people here a year. Uh, oh, wow. For the park itself, yeah. uh, the historic part of the park, we, we end up getting about uh, close to 20,000 a year. So, I see. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for sharing this with well, us. Well, thanks for coming out and, yeah. uh, and spending the day with us. Yeah, this was really fun. Mm -hmm. This was quite a tour we had of the lower Monongahela Valley. I look forward to seeing you on another path peddling adventure.